So hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening according to where you are connected from. Welcome to this GCSP 25th anniversary event titled Are We Finally Ready? I kindly ask you to make sure that your cameras and uh, microphones are turned off um, throughout the entire session. Indeed, we are going to record this event. Uh, for this same reason, questions and comments can be left in the chat. I will then collect them and post them to the speakers who are going to answer live. So please only use the chat and do not turn on your microphone. Uh, I will now would like to welcome our, our speakers, Dr. Gilles Pomerol, who is going to moderate the session, Professor David Friedman and Professor David Heyman. I now leave the floor to Dr. Gilles Pomerol, who is going to introduce the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. So it is a pleasure to be with all of you today. So I am Dr. Gilles Pumral. I worked with the, in international health for the last 40 years, most of them with WHO on epidemics and pandemics. I'm currently associate fellow with the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And I will be moderating this session together with Francesca, who is the assistant program officer. During the next two hours, we will exchange with two experts about where we are in terms of preventing and controlling emerging or re-emerging infections with a potential of international spread, such as the current COVID pandemic. Our first expert, Professor David Eman, is a medical epidemiologist and professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. David has a very rich career in public health and extensive experience in infectious disease prevention and control in Africa and globally. He has been one of the actors of the smallpox eradication. He became executive director of communicable diseases in WHO in 2003 and headed the WHO global response to SARS. Our second expert, Professor David Friedman, is a medical doctor with an extensive career in infectious and tropical diseases and travel health. He has been leading disease surveillance program globally and managing teaching programs in South America. He's currently managing director with Shoreland Travax. You can consult our details biographies on the session site. First, let me frame the context of our session. Um, okay. So Francesca, we can see my screen, I guess. Huh? Yes. Okay, very good. This graph, this graph show the most deadly pandemics over the past 2000 years. There were six plagues pandemics with up to 200 million deaths during the 14th century. Uh, smallpox, which killed more than 50 million in the 16th century, and then yellow fever in the 1800s, also repetitive outbreaks of cholera. If we focus our attention on the past 100 years, the Spanish influenza during the First World War took the life of 50 million people, mostly young adults, followed by the Russian, the Asian, the Hong Kong, and the H1N1 flu pandemics. The AIDS pandemic claimed the life of more than 30 million people in the past 40 years. SARS was the first alert of a coronavirus spreading worldwide at the beginning of this millennium, followed by a second coronavirus, MERS. The Ebola epidemic in West Africa and today the COVID are already claiming the life of more than 1 million people. You can see that so far, the death toll of the current pandemic of COVID here, here, is still relatively low when we compare to the other pandemics of these past two millenniums. 
These pandemics and epidemics not only affect or kill a lot of people, disrupt societies, but they also have a heavy economic impact, ranging from 40 billion US dollars for SARS to more than 50 billion for Ebola, and now a projected cost of more than $10 trillion for COVID-19. The focus of our discussion today will be on infectious events. But we need to remember that global health security is also threatened by recurring chemical accidents, the last one in Beirut, Lebanon this year, or by radionuclear accidents, such as the one in Fukushima, Japan, during the 2011 tsunami. So epidemics and pandemics have always threatened us and will continue to do so. With the emergence of COVID-19, it seemed appropriate to ask ourselves, have we learned enough from the past pandemics and will we be able to prevent the reoccurrence of such events? Are we finally ready? All pandemics events that have occurred in the past century are zoonoses. They originate in animals and the transmission from animals to human is mostly the result of human activity, claiming new lands and then getting in contact with wildlife such as bats, selling wild animals without veterinary control, livestock product in, with hundreds of thousands of animals in single farm, creating an ideal environment for spreading of new bugs and mutation of germ. Climate change, leading to expansion of vectors such as mosquitoes and misuse of antibiotics, leading to resistance. Eight billion people are living on this planet. Poverty, urban concentration, ease and speed of travel, increasing risking human behaviors, also play a key role in the emergence of these communicable disease events. To respond to this emergence of new infectious agents with their economic, social and political impacts, a multitude of initiatives have been taken in the past 30 years. UNAIDS created in 1994 to lead the response to HIV AIDS pandemic. The vaccine islands Gavi gathered in 2000 to improve access to new and underused vaccine for children living in the world's poorest countries. The Independent Panel for Preparedness, Pandemic Preparedness and Response, also created in 2000 to ensure countries and global institutions effectively address health threats. The 2005 revision of the International Health Regulation the legally binding engagement by countries to prevent, protect against, control and provide a public health response to the international spread of diseases. The Alliance for Health Security Cooperation is a platform for facilitating multi-sectorial collaboration on health security capacity and IHR implementation. The Global Research Collaboration for Infectious Disease Preparedness created in 2013 an international network of research funding organizations to facilitate a rapid and effective response to disease to, to infectious disease outbreaks. The Global Health Security Agenda launched in February 2014 to accelerate implementation of international health regulations. The Sendite Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction initiated in 2015. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations Global Partnership launched in 2017 to develop vaccines to stop future epidemics. The World Health Organization for Animal PVS Pathway to improve the compliance of very veterinary services with international standards. The WHO Health Emergency Program launched in 2017 to support country health emergency preparedness and response to public health events. The Global Preparedness Monitoring Board launched in 2018 to ensure preparedness for global health crises. 
the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, global collaboration launched this year to accelerate development, production, and equitable access to COVID tests, treatment, and vaccine. The One Health Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance launched this year to advocate for urgent action to combat antimicrobial drug resistance. So we can see that a multitude of initiatives have been launched in the past years. It seemed that the world was preparing to the current pandemic event and desperately trying to avoid it. One of the key achievements was the international health regulation. They identified a number of core capacities that each country should have to prevent and respond to major public health events, such as surveillance, response, preparedness, risk communication, human resource, laboratory, and capacity at points of entry. To monitor compliance with this regulation, WHO has set up an IHR monitoring and evaluation framework. This framework has its limitations since the only mandatory reporting is a self-assessment of core capacities by countries. Other approaches proposed, such as stimulation, simulation exercise, joint external evaluation, or after reviews are only optional and on a voluntary basis. Not all countries have implemented these more rigorous processes of measurement. The self-assessment reporting shows that as of September 2020, less than half of the African countries have capacities in place, while three quarters have reached this in Europe or in the Americas. Regarding the joint external evaluation, in gray, you see on this map countries which have not yet implemented this joint external evaluation process. Also notice that in red, with countries which have a low rating for their capacity, mostly in Africa. Another set of data from 2019, based on the Health Security Index, show more or less the same ranking than the results of the joint external evaluation. So there seems to be a coherence between data collected. Now, we should question ourselves on the usefulness and validity of these ratings in the current context of COVID, since, for example, the US, UK, or France, while having a good rating for this preparation, are still experiencing serious COVID spread these past few months. Another process of evaluation are in-depth after events global analysis through IHR review committees or independent committees. These IHR review committees have been completed for H1N1, pandemic, Ebola, and completion of IHR core capacities. And there is one ongoing for COVID nowadays. These these uh, committees are quite cumbersome, and most of their recommendations rarely, rarely end up being implemented. An independent UN level panel on Ebola, however, was convened in 2015, and one of its three recommendations, the creation of a WHO Center for Emergency, did get implemented. There is also ongoing an independent panel for uh, pandemic preparedness and response COVID. What about funding? While the Global Fund has been successful at mobilizing 6 billion US dollars per year, the funding of other initiatives or agencies working on global health is sorely lacking. For example, the current budget of 2.5 billion US per year for WHO is equivalent to the yearly budget of the Hospital of Geneva in Switzerland. It has been recently estimated that at least 30 US dollar per year, 30 US billion dollar per year will be necessary to support global preparedness for the next pandemic. To put this in context, 30 billion US dollar is less than 2% of the world military expenditure of 2000 billion US dollar each year. And it is less than 0.5% 
of the 10 trillion US dollar estimated cost of this pandemic? Should and can we mobilize the funds needed for preparedness? On a positive side, in a difficult war and limited context resource, the WHO succeeded together with national authority to control the largest outbreak of Ebola in Benin DRC in 2018 and 2019. Of note is that a new Ebola vaccine was produced in a record time and used effectively during this outbreak. Also, extremely encouraging is the news that a very effective vaccine against coronavirus was developed in less than a year and will be made available soon. So if we manage to distribute this vaccine widely, we may be able to control this pandemic in a very short term. However, epidemics, some of them with a potential of becoming pandemic, still occur regularly. On this graph, you see that more than a thousand events in a six years period, some of them such as yellow fever, despite the availability of an accessible and very effective vaccine. Also, despite good knowledge on the disease and availability of effective interventions, 40 years after its discovery, HIV continued to infect about 2 million people every year. However, no vaccine has yet been developed. So one may wonder, is the vaccine really the only key for controlling pandemics? Once again, this year, a resolution of the World Health Assembly requested member states and WHO to support the development of capacities at country level. So taking into consideration these elements, I will ask three questions to our part panel members. The first one is, what are, we, what are the health security challenges of the future? So David uh, Heyman, if you want to give us your opinion on this, and then David Friedman. Thanks very much, Gilles. Thanks for a very clear presentation as well. It's a real difficult issue to say what are the health security challenges of the future, but there are some known challenges and there are many unknown challenges. And those known challenges merit attention at present and include such things as antimicrobial resistance, which will certainly in the future become more and more of a health security issue involving all of us because we all use antibiotics from time to time. So if we end up with a world where there's an increase in antimicrobial resistance, we will at the same time see our health security being, being challenged. In addition, um, health security challenges are not only coming from diseases. As you said um, earlier, Jill, they also come from chemicals and they come from nuclear threats as well. But even more important, health security can be divided into personal health security and um, if you would, more collective health security. And so let me just talk a little bit about those because in my view, health security is much like a chameleon that changes color depending on its environment. Because I, if I'm sitting in an industrialized country and I see an outbreak occurring in a developing country, my view of health security is to keep that disease out of my country. But if I'm living in that country where that disease is causing an outbreak, then my concern would be how do I get health care that can take care of me if I become sick or if my family becomes sick. So it's more of an individual issue. So what we really need to do in the future and the challenge for health security is to link both collective health security and individual health security together so that we don't just stop at borders, but so that our political leaders and also our funding agencies understand that health security involves both individual and collective, making sure that there's access to healthcare in countries, making sure that there are protections for disease as it spreads internationally. 
So that's just the beginning answer, and I'm sure David will be able to add a lot more. Thank you, Jill, and back to you. Thank you. So, uh, David Friedman, you, can you give us your opinion on this issue? Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me uh, to this, uh, Jill. I'm going to try to... Um, uh, I'm going to try to share my screen. I have a couple of slides. Maybe can you turn off your, I think you need to turn off your, uh, if I can, let me see if I can do it for you, uh, Jill. It's done. Yeah. Um, okay. You are screen sharing. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Okay, do, uh, do you see the slides now? Yes, perfect. Okay, so um, just, um, to, uh, um, you know, D uh, David uh, went through uh, some generalities just to talk about um, um, some aspects um, of the actual uh, diseases for those that are not medical uh, people. Um, you can kind of group the, um, the threats into uh, uh, different um, groupings of uh, diseases by their mode of uh, transmission. And this is a fairly standard um, list of uh, um, some of the um, major uh, emerging diseases over the past couple of um, decades. And because I think the health security issues and the prevention um, issues and the interventions um, may differ uh, some, um, somewhat. So there are um, vector-borne um, diseases um, like uh, chikungunya, like um, dengue, like Zika is the most recent one. Respiratory viruses, which probably have the most rapidly um, explosive uh, uh, potential in terms of um, rapid spread. And of course, uh, you know, coronavirus and um, um, influenzas, especially zoonotic influenzas um, are gonna be important there. And then there are the ones that um, can have reservoirs um, in humans and spread by uh, human to human contact. And I think that was the, um, th that was the case um, from um, with Ebola, which caused an incredible amount of, um, you know, fear, um, even though the, you know, potential um, for um, explosive uh, spread was uh, uh, perhaps uh, not as, uh, um, um, not as, um, not as much. And one of the reasons for that is that people are um, infectious mostly only when they're symptomatic. So if you can put in the intervention to identify symptomatic people, it's a lot easier than the situation we're facing now um, with um, with uh, with um, with COVID. So, um, and uh, with mosquito, the main point I haven't covered on this one is that the main um, thing, of course, with vector-borne diseases and explosion, uh, explosive potential, is where the mosquitoes are located. So, um, and, and, and whether they are widespread uh, mosquitoes, there are different kinds of uh, uh, mosquitoes. Uh, many of the viruses we've been dealing with are, are spread by Aedes um, mosquitoes. Um, it would be a lot more problematic uh, for something spread by Culicine mosquitoes, which are um, more common even in, um, 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 even, even in temperate, um, even in temperate uh, countries. Um, the, um, so, so that's, uh, that's important. And then, you know, security depends on, um, uh, the situation and the reservoir. So in terms of thinking of that, I think MERS was a good, uh, example, um, of that, the so-called camel flu of the Middle East, um, uh, because uh, the human to human, even though it's a respiratory um, virus, um, human to human uh, transmission um, seems to be a problem in healthcare settings, uh, but less so um, in uh, the community. Uh, but as long as you have a sustained reservoir that you're unwilling to get rid of, uh, such as uh, MERS with um, camels, in this case, it's um, remaining to be a um, um, a regional problem rather than um, rather than a global uh, problem. Although there was one, um, you know, major situation of it uh, getting out into the community in uh, in Korea a few years ago. Um, 
as I said, Aedes mosquitoes in places where you have Aedes, that's a real um, um, threat because um, that they, they, um, uh, they, they, they uh, because you can introduce once travel, which is something I'm very interested in, um, gets them um, out there. Uh, but but the other issue with the Aedes mosquito spread diseases is um, that with climate change, and I think, uh, again, um, this, uh, you know, I think there's uh, probably other sessions on, on, on climate change, um, but climate change does have uh, the potential to uh, affect the distribution of uh, mosquitoes as um, temperate countries uh, become uh, become be, become warmer. So um, these diseases, the temperate countries such as the United States and uh, Europe, uh, don't worry about the, this is a little bit of an old map. It's the red, red ones and yellow ones to worry about, but uh, they've actually spread um, um, a little bit more now. So you do have outbreaks of things like um, Zika and dengue now occurring at least during the summer in places like Spain and France and, uh, um, and, uh, and Italy. Uh, and, and as I said, um, in terms of the human to human um, threats, things like Ebola or other hemorrhagic fevers, uh, perhaps monkeypox, um, uh, with human to human spread, uh, I think many are familiar. And this is um, this is what happened with sporadic cases during the 2014 West African Ebola, um, you know, outbreak. But again, something um, has the potential to you know catch by surprise uh, um, and, um, and 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 be introduced quite widely, uh, although perhaps not as rapidly um, as um, as rapidly as uh, um, explosive. So I think those are my um, preliminary, um, um, you know, comments on, on the things that we need to perhaps look at um, for uh, the future. So not just specific, um, not just specific agents, but mode, um, you know, mode of spread and the security um, sort of approaches um, we might need to uh, take um, depending on the characteristics uh, of the um, disease. And David, I, I haven't talked about um, antimicrobial resistance and I agree completely uh, you know, with David about the um, threat we face um, for antimicrobial resistance and also the potential um, solutions. Because inevitably, although um, the pharmaceutical industry is, um, is doing much better at introducing uh, new drugs um, nowadays, um, you know, the tendency is um, if it's a bad bug, you need a, an expensive drug. And uh, the tendency, if something gets widespread, the tendency is not to introduce cheap drugs. And we're, you know, we're, we're you know, it would be the same thing with um, vaccines as well. So that that is a preparedness um, um, issue to you know, um, like we have with um, vaccines for, um, uh, you know, organizations like Gavi and CEPI, um, but, you know, that that is uh, something we, we need to look to in the future is how to, um, you know, get um, effective drugs uh, widely distributed in the world, especially to um, disadvantaged countries. So um, let me stop my remarks uh, there on this and uh, see uh, if we have some questions next. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Jill. Well, thank you very much uh, for this uh, input to our discussion. Uh, it seemed that uh, at this stage, uh, we don't have a, a question, I think, uh, Francesca yet. Huh? You, uh, we have a question, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, someone is asking, why should not country devote X amount of their military budget to pandemic prevention? And why should not country use military personnel for tracking, given that we seem to be unable to do that adequately with available civilian personnel? So David, Evan, you want to give uh, your opinion on that? Which um, let, well, let me let me comment on the um, let me comment on the um, um, what the military is doing, and and maybe uh, the other David can comment on uh, uh, the proposal uh, to um, earmark uh, a certain proportion. Um, <clears throat> In fact, in my work, um, uh, many militaries, uh, many of the large, rich militaries, of course, um, actually um, provide some of the best um, surveillance um, that is uh, out there. They have many 
early warning systems uh, in the United States, um, um, the, the American military um, it maintains a large, um, uh, um, reasonably well-funded uh, infrastructure. Uh, they actually uh, maintain uh, laboratory facilities in about um, seven or eight uh, different places uh, around the world to sort of um, uh, um, sample the environment, you know, in places like in Peru and in Bangkok and in Jakarta. And so, um, so they are out there um, doing this because it definitely is regarded, um, at least by the U.S. military, it definitely is regarded as a national security um, threat and, of course, a threat to um, troops that might have to go um, into, um, into combat um, somewhere. And I know, and I can say I know, I, I can know in dealings with um, several um, European militaries that uh, perhaps not as large, uh, but they all do have um, central uh, offices and central uh, mechanisms um, that are um, that are tracking and analyzing um, those um, those sorts of things. And again, especially in places where um, they're deployed. So especially, for example, you're in France. Uh, especially, you know, the French um, have uh, military interests in many parts of the world, and and they do have surveillance. Uh, um, ongoing. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. David, David, you want to add up uh, some yeah. elements to this? Yeah, thanks. You know, one of the problems in public health is if there's an underinvestment by countries, both in domestic public health to take care of people when outbreaks occur, and also in the research and development of new um, interventions that might be useful for public health especially to increase our public health security. And so a goal um, in public health by good public health institutes should be to see how they can convert some of the military funding into strengthening domestic public health as a security threat. And some countries have had quite good success with that, in particular in the US, the Center for Disease Control was able to make an argument that there needed to be more investment in research and development for um, public health um, in general, and especially for disease organisms that the US felt were organisms that could be used for bioterrorism. And on that list, there were about 11 different diseases and in the, night, in the early 2000s, just after the anthrax attacks, which were deliberately used anthrax in the US to cause terror, there was an agency called BARDA, which was set up, which channels funding from the military into research for vaccines, for drugs, and for diagnostic tests for those diseases that are on the list. Well, one of those diseases happens to be Ebola, and that's why in 2013 and 2014, there was a vaccine already developed and ready to do field trials in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, investment in broad public health issues that increase national security can also increase global health security. And that vaccine for Ebola was not in any way developed for humanitarian purposes. It was developed as a pure deterrent mechanism and as a pure protective me mechanism for US citizens. Yet by developing it, it became a public good which is now being used in Ebola outbreaks. So yes, military budgets should be converted to public health as a defense mechanism. And in many ways they are in the VARDA efforts and also in other efforts to strengthen national public health. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, Francesca, any uh, other question coming up? No. All right. So uh, maybe we can uh, move to uh, our second question now. Uh, so the second question is, uh, is the international uh, community, let me share my screen with you, uh, is the international community and are individual countries prepared for the next pandemics? So who wants to start? Uh, 
giving comments on this. Go ahead, David. Okay, so um, let me let me get back to the um, let me get back to the share again. Um, okay, so current preparation. I wanted to make um, just a few comments. I know it's not a medical um, audience, but just a few general things um, on. Um, you know, on vaccines, because I think that's, uh, as David started to say with, um, and it did start with the Ebola um, in, in 2014 with um, quite a unique uh, vaccine on a viral vector um, um, uh, um, backbone. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the bright lights uh, here, and uh, as Jill said, may get us out of this um, um, epidemic or pandemic uh, sooner um, rather than later, ha has been um, innovations in vaccines. And I think in, in terms of, you know, current preparation, um, um, to, to point this out as one of the, um, as one of the highlights, um, you know, just a um, little bit of uh, background. And what I'm doing is there are uh, something like 300, you know, candidate vaccines uh, out there and, uh, and, and, and about 30 or 40 in some kind of uh, clinical um, um, development. Um, I focused on the six that are probably um, the farthest um, um, along, and these are the ones um, that, that have actually um, been funded. The, you know, one of the things I think uh, David mentioned, BARDA and others, um, um, 12 or $15 billion have been invested in rapid uh, development of um, vaccines. And this is, uh, this is an important approach. What they've done was that they have chosen to invest heavily in a limited number of uh, vaccines, which were um, carefully um, um, uh, organized um, early on. And um, in perhaps a military type fail safe approach, um, the idea was to um, fund, uh, um, you know, more than more than we may need. If we're lucky, we can use uh, them all. Uh, but to build redundancy uh, into the system, to, so choose three. Um, three completely different um, platforms or, or vaccines with three completely different uh, mechanisms of action, and then actually fund uh, two companies um, to, um, um, to 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 develop um, to develop vaccines. So if it's a good approach, but the company messes up, they'll be uh, the other company will uh, come up with uh, something uh, viable. And, and to date, this has worked out. Um, this has worked out. Um, Quite well. In fact, one of the um, one of the companies uh, uh, on this list here, um, Pfizer, actually didn't even accept uh, funding so that they could have a little bit uh, more autonomy. But uh, uh, but they but the U.S. government pre-purchased um, some of uh, their their vaccines. So some of the issues, uh, just in terms of future planning, uh, um, uh, to think about that that have emerged is, uh, for example, cold chain. Do you need a cold chain? Um, the vaccine that's probably the farthest ahead right now um, needs a very, very elaborate uh, cold chain with uh, types of freezers that really nobody, um, um, you know, nobody has in order to get it out um, into the community. Solutions are at hand, uh, but, but, it, but it's certainly uh, an additional um, challenge. Um, by offering money, you get an awful lot of uh, innovative actors um, um, onto the scene. So some of these are uh, uh, companies that were funded are pharmaceutical um, giants that could um, really develop, um, um, you know, things on their own. Um, you know, uh, you know, probably able to take some financial risk, but others are very innovative small companies that really don't have. Um, the infrastructure to do things or capacity uh, to do things very quickly, and they need the billion or two dollars. They have a great platform or, or, or a great uh, uh, perspective, and it may fail completely. So, you know, um, the ability to think out of the box um, in developing interventions, I think, uh, is something um, that we've done um, um, very well. And who knows what's going to happen in the end? I mean, the very traditional green is good stuff, the very traditional protein subunit um, vaccines um, um, 
take longer to develop, longer to produce, more expensive to produce, um, but we have a lot more experience um, um, with their um, safety and long-term uh, effectiveness or immunogenicity um, than we do with um, that we do with some of these very innovative. There's there, the mRNA vaccine um, that we're looking at now is perhaps even being available in the next few weeks or month is never been used in humans before. It's been it's been in development for a long time and a lot of animal work, but it's never been uh, a vaccine made like this has never been um, developed um, um, developed um, before. Um, continue to buy um, uh, the the dosing columns here show you about uh, the um, uh, show you about uh, the pre purchase and again. Um, you know, the, the companies don't want to take um, risks. So basically, um, um, many governments, uh, you can see there, um, have pre-purchased a, a vaccine based on speculation. And if, you know, if those vaccines aren't very good, they're still committed to, you know, or something better comes along, um, the company gets paid for doses that they have produced um, at risk, even if they sit indefinitely um, um, at a warehouse. So at risk production um, is also something, I mean, we, we've yet to see this pandemic hasn't played out, um, but um, at risk uh, per, per, produc uh, production is, uh, is, is something we've done uh, to uh, prepare here. Um, the other thing, you know, the other thing we haven't done much in terms of are we, you know, ready, um, the, you know, the, the other thing we, we still need to improve on, and, and I think these poll numbers, the, this is from about a month or two ago, um, and the poll numbers with the encouraging news about um, the newer vaccines, um, but, but really, um, and, and, you know, I think vaccine hesitancy is, um, you know, a problem everywhere, not in the U.S., although these are U.S., um, um, data, uh, but but you know you you have somewhere between forty and sixty percent of the population that's willing to take uh, the vaccine, and it's higher in um, it's higher in um, um, Caucasians, white Americans than in Black Americans, and you know um, Black Americans have have more of a distrust of the uh, system, and um, only forty percent said that they would take a vaccine. Uh, when it became available. So this is clearly um, something we need to be more prepared for, the sort of general vaccine hesitancy issue if vaccines are gonna be the way out of um, pandemics. Um, um, we need to do better as a baseline between uh, uh, pandemics and educating uh, people um, about vaccines. Um, um, we've also done a lot of thinking about uh, prepare about um, allocation of vaccines. So, uh, and that's uh, shown here. And I think it's going to be different in different countries. And that's something we haven't quite refined a lot of mathematical models um, on who to give what would be not just ethically um, 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 and, and morally um, the best way to allocate and prioritize. Obviously, you can't vaccinate everybody um, um, all at once um, um, because there won't be enough doses. Um, all at once, and a lot of thought has gone into developing different models um, um, in each country. And I can't really speak to the, and I'm most familiar with the US, uh, David may be able to speak to um, um, the international um, thinking or thinking of, uh, or, you know, WHO, et cetera, um, on this. Um, but this is, um, you know, this is the, um, this is the um, current, but I think we're gonna learn, um, you know, quite a bit because it is based as well um, not just on uh, ethical and, and moral, um, but on um, which um, model of prioritization would actually control the pandemic uh, the most quickly or be most effective um, in um, doing so. And one thing we really don't know yet that can't be plugged into the models is the um, effect on transmission. Right now we have some preliminary um, efficacy data and some in different age groups, et cetera. Um, but the endpoints that are being used in the trials are 
um, um, clinical disease, not even, you know, you, and you can look at severe disease during mi versus mild disease, but it's clinical disease. A critical question, of course, in interrupting the pandemic is going to be which, um, which model, um, you know, most effectively stops uh, or which vaccine most effectively um, stops um, um, transmissions. So um, I think th those are details um, here. Um, let, let me stop. If, if, if we have time, I can talk a little bit later about um, travel and how we, we, we need to be prepared for, um, um, you know, for travel and the uh, revolution that's going to occur in travel and spread of the disease. But let me just go ahead and uh, turn it over uh, uh, to David for his uh, in initial thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, uh, David, and thanks, you. Um, the question was, are, is the international community and our individual countries prepared for the next uh, pandemics? And I think, you know, what's going on today is a good indicator of how countries need to be prepared and which ones are best prepared, as well as the international organizations. And so I might start with the international organizations and with WHO, which Jill and I know quite well. Um, despite the geopolitical tensions that have been occurring in the world uh, regarding this pandemic, um, WHO's technical arm has continued to work very well and to collect information from all countries to make sure that information is used in preparing guidelines and providing guidance to countries and has done a very good job in getting that data out to countries so that countries know the position of WHO and therefore the best practice that's associated with various interventions. Um, in addition, the medical journals have actually been rapidly peer reviewing and publishing new information on the online in front of the paywalls so that there's a vast amount of information. Um, so globally, as far as information is concerned, both through WHO and through the medical journals, there's been an ability to really understand this pandemic very early, understanding the virus, how it's transmitted, what its epidemiology is, and what works to deal with pandemic in various countries. If you look at individual countries, and I think Jill said this earlier, the, there was no real good predictor of which countries were prepared. In fact, um, the uh, index that is collected each year by Hopkins University and the Nuclear Threats Initiative was absolutely wrong in what they were predicting as those countries which were best um, prepared. And so it's really not an indicator. What's more of an indicator is how countries are pre pre performing now and what lessons we can learn from that. And if any of you come from the region in Asia, um, certainly the countries that are doing the best job in the most sustainable manner in this current pandemic are Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Japan and Hong Kong. Those areas from the very beginning, and this was early in January already, were detecting outbreaks caused by importation of virus from China, and they were rapidly responding to those outbreaks and shutting them down. They weren't saying we can't do this, this acts like flu, because in reality it doesn't act like flu. And what they've been able to do is through good contact tracing, identify contacts, get those contacts isolated and prevent transmission into the community. And at the same time, they've been able to find out where transmission is occurring by good epidemiological investigation. And they've shut those parts of their economy down rather than just a blunt shutdown of the entire economy. That's worked quite well. They've shut down entertainment sectors in many areas, nightclubs, They've opened them up again. If they saw the transmission again increased in those areas, they shut them down. They've done the same with schools. They've done the same with gyms. They've done the same with, with many different areas, uh, looking epidemiologically where transmission is occurring and shutting it down, preserving their economies while preserving lives. And if you look, those countries in Asia have had actually the lowest mortality rates as well as the most lowest uh, transmission, even though they've had major outbreaks associated with religious um, um, ceremonies. Um, what the tendency has been, though, 
has been for the lower and middle income countries has been to say, well, we don't need to invest so much with them in their capacities. We can create global mechanisms that will respond to these outbreaks. But that's really not the correct way of going. All countries subscribe to the um, international health regulations that Jill talked about. And those regulations require countries to have good national capacity so that they're able to not only rapidly detect, but rapidly respond to outbreaks and therefore prevent the spread internationally. So if there's one thing we need to do as we move forward, it's to change this paradigm of industrialized countries saying, we will respond with the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network of WHO and others to outbreaks in developing and middle-income countries. What we need to do is say, those countries need to have the capacity and we need to contribute alongside them to make sure that they do develop the capacity that's necessary to rapidly and detect and respond to outbreaks as we're seeing is occurring now in those countries that have learned and have good capacities, those countries in Asia. Why are those countries in Asia so well prepared? Well, clearly they had SARS outbreaks, they had MERS corona outbreaks, they learned from what had happened in the past. My own country, the US, the country in which I live now, the UK, has not had a really coordinated response. And that's in my view, mainly because the political leaders and the public health leaders have not been able to come to agreement on what needs to be done. And so in many countries, there's a political promise of, we will protect you by suppressing our economies until there's a vaccine but that vaccine will take a long time to get distributed and the disease will likely become endemic anyway. So those are just some observations, you know, to hopefully stimulate some discussion. Back to you. Thank you very much. So uh, Francesca, do we have any questions coming up? Yes, we do. We have some questions. So the first one is um, the recent pushback in a lot of countries by citizens on measures to curb the spread of the virus reflects a general unwillingness by citizens to temporarily or permanently change their lifestyles. Do you see a situation in the future where government would be more aggressive in imposing measures to curb future pandemics, especially where developing vaccines would be ex expensive and time consuming? Maybe I'll start with um, the population and then David, you could take over after that. Um, certainly there is pushback in many countries. And I attribute this to the fact that people need to understand why they're doing things and they need to make their own risk assessments. And let's just take, for example, the end of year holidays that are coming up. There's been a lot of concern and countries are dictating to their populations what they should be doing. It might be more effective if people understood the messages and took the risk assessment into their own hands. For example, if people are concerned about being around the same table at one of the end of year holidays, such as Christmas, then perhaps the solution is to get people to understand that they can safely sit around that table if there are not people who have comorbidities if there are not elderly people who have a uh, risk of getting severe illness, and if those people who are going to the dinner have not had a potential exposure to COVID within the previous 10 days. And that exposure could be at a Christmas party, it could be at places where people gather. So if people understand this and do their own risk assessments, they might be, the governments might not have to be so dictatorial and people might in the end be able to deal with this pandemic much better because populations must be at the base of the response. In Asia, there is a solidarity. People understand for many, many years already that it's not only their responsibility to protect themselves, but to protect others. And that's why Asia, even in the 1990s, people who had respiratory infections were wearing masks to protect others. So it's logical to them that they do need to protect others as well as themselves. And we need to make sure our citizens in all countries understand those same messages. So I'll turn over to David now for further discussion on that. Um, and over to you, David. 
Uh, thank you, David. I, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly. Um, it's, it, it, it is a difficult task, I think, uh, not being um, a sociologist, but, you know, certainly there are different societal um, differences in, you know, the willingness uh, of the um, population um, to, um, you know, think of the community um, versus self. Um, and, um, you know, I think, uh, as David said, I agree, you know, Asian societies um, may be a little bit more uh, used to this, um, um, especially um, during, um, you know, especially during their previous um, um, experiences. I, you know, I think that it is, you have to be very, um, you know, draconian. I mean, China, um, you know, early on took some very draconian measures, which I don't think, uh, honestly, are, are, you know, possible um, hardly anywhere else um, in the world. And I don't think um, the governments are, are in a position um, to go um, that far. So um, increasing education, um, of course, but um, also going to need to um, deal with people and whether there's a need to educate um, you know, people to educate other people rather than um, government and public health um, doing um, um, all the education. You know, I, I, I just don't see, um, you know, somebody that would go to a motorcycle rally with uh, 400,000 people um, is, is uh, you know, without masks um, is not necessarily so, um, um, so easy uh, to educate. So, um, you know, I, I, I do see uh, I do see difficulties in um, the, the authoritarian uh, approach in, um, you know, in in many countries. And, you know, I, I don't think it's just the U.S. I mean, I think we're seeing, you know, similar um, similar things in Europe. And I, you know, it's, it's hard for a democratically elected government to, um, 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 to go too far. So personal responsibility um, um, is good. Um, I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure that there's going to be an answer. And I think paradoxically, um, if, you know, even though it's going to be, you know, almost a year, you know, the possibility of developing a vaccine so rapidly is going to weigh on people's minds in the future. They're just going to say, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, there's going to be a vaccine coming and, you um, and uh, we're, we're, we're just going to um, we're just going to wait for the um, for the vaccine. So we need to do better. But um, I, I, I'm not sure it's going to uh, happen. Uh, it, it's going to happen all the way. Thank you. Any other question, uh, Francisca? Yes, we, for example, have a question on uh, pandemic preparedness. Do you think that paradoxically states would have, would have been better prepared to force an induced pandemic like sparked by an intentional biological attack rather than a natural virus? If so, why? Joe, who should, should, do you want to? Well, uh, wh whoever thinks that you, you want to start. Okay, well, maybe I'll say that the, respond, the public health response to an outbreak is the same whether it's deliberately caused or naturally occurring. So number one, what we've shown is that if there were major outbreaks of infectious disease that attacked the entire population as has this pandemic, then no, countries are not prepared for a biological uh, weapons attack, nor are they uh, prepared for this current pandemic. But biological weapon attacks, if they were used, would likely be in small discrete areas, and hopefully they would be better prepared than on the global level, although it's not really certain to me whether or not that's the case. But you know, um, being prepared for public health is for both naturally and deliberately caused outbreaks. Where the problems occur is when the police system and the forensic system has to begin to work with the public health community. Many times that's a very difficult activity uh, for the public health people to be involved in. So 
that needs to be an area that's addressed through simulation exercises and other activities which have gone on in many countries to make sure that there is smooth work in between those parts of government. Over to you, David, for any further observations. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. Respond, uh, you know, responses the um, responses the same. Um, you know, I, I think the um, you know the difference is the you know biologic is often more um, su um, su um, surreptitious because the actual um, you know you may know not know when the actual primary um, um, event um, um, took place. So, you know, in terms of actual preparedness, um, it's, you know, it's uh, a, a different kind of surveillance um, um, that you, you might need because of the um, focal um, location. Uh, but once it gets out there, um, you know, I think the response is going to be quite um, is going to be quite similar, um, you know, although it may be uh, an agent uh, that one is less, you know, that, 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 that one is less, uh, uh, you know, um, prepared for, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, smallpox, et cetera, um, you know, would be quite, uh, would be quite, um, you know, a nightmare. I mean, one scenario that's been proposed is, you know, sort of um, putting, um, you know, getting some, you um, you know, getting some uh, martyrs infected and putting them on a airplane, you know, out of a out of a hub and having them breathe on everybody during, you know, the flight, and then that then all the other passengers get infected and go um, all over the world. So uh, there is the possibility to introduce, uh, um, you know, kind of a, a, a an agent uh, that one would be um, less prepared uh, to deal for, or or was perhaps a little bit um, lower down. Uh, on the um, on the on the preparedness um, lists, but on the other hand, uh, as David said, that's exactly why uh, we were so well prepared for Ebola. Um, um, you know, w when it did uh, come along, uh, the, the 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 research was uh, kind of underfunded, et cetera. But it, it uh, for you know for a decade or more, and that's why it took so long. But um, you know, in the end, uh, we we ended up being quite well. Um, I'm prepared um, um, for it. So, um, you know, I would keep some of those agents on our list and keep preparedness for some of those agents, uh, um, you know, um, on our list for investment. And I, I hope that's, uh, um, you know, also one of the lessons um, here, yeah, just keeping, keeping the infrastructure in place for uh, very unique uh, pathogens. Thank you. Thank you, David. Francesca, any, any other question? Uh, yes, we have a comment on the measures put in place to counter the spread of the virus. Um, uh, this person comments that the COVID response has suffered from a lack of a consensus on scientific information, and he gives the example of the masks. We were told that masks don't help, and we still hear dissonant views regarding whether Medication X works. It seems to me that we don't have any scientific data on which containment measure works best. Lockdown, confinement, curfew. Thank you. David, do you want to give your... Yeah, um, but, right. I, you know, I think, um, uh, again, I think uh, the point is that it's a matter of um, multi-layered uh, interventions. Um, you know, I think many people may be looking for the hundred percent, you know, the one thing, the hundred percent solution. I think we know by now um, from a public health point of view, uh, there's not the hundred percent um, solution and that the, um, the, um, the layers, there's the so-called uh, Swiss cheese uh, model that's been uh, proposed where you have multiple pieces of Swiss cheese with, um, um, with uh, the holes in different places as you put all the pieces uh, together so that um, each, each one has, uh, a, a, each intervention uh, has efficacy at uh, different um, um, places, but together when you put all the pieces of cheese together, um, then, um, that, then perhaps you uh, can be highly effective at uh, blocking um, everything from uh, one thing from, you know, uh, getting through all the layers. Um, so, so, so I think, you know, I think that's, um, I think that's where we are. Um, you know, I, I think we have been a, a little disadvantaged um, by the high level um, of attention and, you um, 
Um, the number of uh, experts that have emerged, I mean, I think uh, there, there's probably about two you know, two to five billion experts uh, um, on this uh, outbreak and um, social media, Twitter, um, and other, um, you know, platforms uh, have ma made it very easy for not only, you know, never mind the misinformation piece, um, but um, just uh, everybody with an opinion, um, you know, um, is sitting at home um, with ample time um, to, uh, to express um, their opinion. And I think this is a place where, um, you know, organizations um, like um, WHO and um, national public health organizations, you know, still need to redouble um, their efforts at getting a, a very focused, uh, getting a very focused message um, um, out there. Um, you know, the masks are particularly um, difficult uh, because, uh, you know, clearly uh, the source control effect of masks rather than the personal, this goes to what we've been uh, discussing a little bit before, um, you know, uh, source control as community protection, um, you know, is, is probably the main effect of the types of masks that people are going to have um, access to in the community and the personal protection um, you know, is, um, you know, is a little bit less. And I think that's the mistake that was, you know, this uh, well-publicized Danish mask study that uh, recently, um, you know, came out. I think that's, you know, um, 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 the issue that's coming up in the interpretation um, of that. We need to work together. Um, we need to work together as a, um, you know, as a community and, and, and the governments need to uh, uh, do their part where they can um, improve the testing and tracing um, and everything, um, um, everything like that, and then get the message, you know, get the message uh, uniformly out. I think another, um, you know, I think another point to be made there is that um, strong central messaging um, which is, I think, what the questioner was getting after. Um, you know, th there is a tendency, um, you know, uh, in, in, in most um, uh, advanced countries, local or regional authorities, uh, state, provincial, et cetera, um, authorities really have final uh, jurisdiction on health matters. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, even, um, you know, strongish messaging from the center, if there's not consensus at the local and regional level, uh, does lead to very mixed, um, um, you know, messaging on some of these issues that are frankly based on uh, an evolution of knowledge. And, and, and I think that is something we can do better to educate uh, the public about. Uh, I mean, knowledge evolves. Every agent is different. Um, um, you know, what works for flu may or may not work for uh, coronavirus. Uh, they're, they're, they're different um, diseases with, with different uh, transmission um, um, parameters. And, uh, you know, knowledge during a pandemic uh, as, as a dynamic thing, um, I think is something we can um, um, do better at uh, communicating. Thank you. David Martin, you will. Uh, I'll just add something. You know, there has been a lot of confusion and recommendations have changed over time. And it's normal that that happens with a new disease. With a new infection at the start, you look to see what other infections might be similar and what might be working to control them. And then you decide, do I want to use any of those interventions to as precautionary measures with this new disease that comes along? And just take the mask issue, for example. I think there's no question that masks prevent others from getting infected. Medical workers have used masks during surgery for the last 50 years. And by so doing, they protect the patient who's having surgery from getting infected from what they're breathing or speaking out. So those were naturally measures which at the start were assumed as precautionary measures and they were taken by countries that wanted to and they used them because in the end, we're all building this ship at the same time and everybody's learning from everybody else. But clearly as more evidence comes in, those precautionary measures that were put in place might be modified, they might even become no longer necessary if the evidence shows that they aren't effective. And that's the stage where we are now with this outbreak, looking to see what's been effective and what hasn't. Have lockdowns been effective? 
Myself, I don't believe that, I think they've been effective in forcing physical distancing and in suppressing transmission, but is that what we really needed to be doing? Or could we have done a better job by just locking down certain sectors, which is what the Asians are doing? And I have to say, um, I saw a question go by about Switzerland. Um, why is it that Switzerland, when they unlocked, had this increase in transmission? Well, I think that was common in many countries because many countries locked down without an exit strategy. And clearly an exit strategy should have been, we will make sure that we open up the sectors that are safe and those that we don't know about yet, we won't open up. And so why were nightclubs and pubs and restaurants where people congregate all opened up after this extensive lockdown? And why did they then we know that they were sources of infection. Infection increased in those, whereas if countries had left them down had targeted compensation toward those sectors and let the others open up, we might not be in the situation we are today where countries have again done a blunt lockdown. So I hope that now there are strategies, and I think there are, I saw the strategies in France of coming out with lockdown, not overnight opening up everything, but opening up gradually. Over. Thank you. So I think we are going to uh, go to our last question now. And uh, this last question is how can we better prepare for the future? Uh, so uh, David Friedman, you want to start? Oh, your microphone is not on. Microphone? Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to share my screen. Can you stop your share? Um, yes, I do. Yeah, let me do it. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay. So um, I, I just want to say, um, I just want to say, um, better preparation. Um, just a few things. Let me talk a little bit about uh, um, um, the travel now. Certainly that's uh, something uh, that needs to be um, improved on an international uh, basis um, um, moving um, forward and um, open borders, closed borders. That's been uh, a different stages in time and ongoing um, um, debate. Um, the, you know, um, you know, can we get a clear message um, or how can we get a clear message and do things uh, and be better prepared in the future, you know, given uh, the things that are um, listed here. And it's not just about uh, transmission actually um, on the airplane. It's about um, what countries do um, uh, for, for arriving passengers, um, you know, whether it's quarantine, whether uh, it's, it, you know, it's testing, um, do we need to do better at defining risk at the destination? Because if there's risk of the destination and people are going, um, you know, back home, um, that, that's something uh, to consider. Um, that's something to uh, consider um, as well. Um, you know, a number of organizations with um, significant interests, of course, like um, IATA, um, which represents the uh, uh, trade association, which represents uh, the world's um, 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 airlines, um, have put together some uh, uh, very interesting uh, data, which is actually freely accessible at this point. Um, um, now it's actually used by the airlines to plan, um, um, you know, their, their flights and their service and everything um, like that. Um, this is changing, you know, every day, um, you know, uh, you know, France is changing once a week. Some, some of the uh, European countries are changing um, their rules two or three times a week in terms of list of countries uh, from which uh, travel is acceptable. Um, it's actually uh, quite a mishmash of um, things. I, so I think, you know, better preparation, of course, would um, uh, uh, necessitate uh, better um, uniformity and, um, you know, attempts, it's, it, it's difficult. Attempts have been made over the summer um, and fall. Uh, you know, uh, the European Union uh, has, you know, tried to enforce a um, standard uh, template 
um, you know, on, on, on member countries with common criteria, et cetera. And um, it's um, been very modestly um, um, uptake, uh, uptake by the, uh, taken up uh, by, the, uh, by the individual um, um, countries. And again, just to, you know, hammer this home, red, green countries, um, you know, we now have a hundred, you know, is this um, of benefit or not? We have a, um, we're moving a little bit away from a quarantine, which is clearly a, of all arrivals, which is, which, which is clearly uh, um, um, inhibits um, um, just about everything, not only um, economic. Um, and, uh, you know, now, now you have this whole mess of different testing regulations, but make no mistake, um, the majority of the 240 uh, uh, sort of uh, national um, entities um, in the world, the vast majority of countries have some kind of um, PCR uh, requirement, whether it's a mandatory PCR on arrival or a so-called test out. In other words, if you have a negative test, you can escape um, from um, quarantine. Um, and, um, you know, some extremely elaborate uh, China um, last week or two weeks ago introduced um, um, uh, double testing. You not only have to have negative PCR, uh, you know, sorry, I, I didn't get it on this uh, version of the slide. Um, you need to have an antibody test as well as a PCR um, to get into um, um, China. And that's only a limited list of uh, uh, limited list of uh, people. So um, it, it certainly can get to be uh, the, um, the extreme um, um, biosensors, um, uh, wearable tracking devices, mandatory apps on the phone. Um, you know, this, the, this is obviously disturbing some privacy advocates um, um, as well. And there's a large number um, of uh, countries that are now uh, making the downloading of a app where they can track you. And then the biosensors are, are primarily um, detecting um, uh, what they can detect for those that wear, you know, um, um, uh, um, uh, 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 these things to monitor their exercise. They can not only, um, they can not only monitor um, your heart rate, uh, in some cases, respiratory rate, your heart rate, uh, as well as a fever. And so, um, so some places like Hong Kong are doing these wearable um, biosensors. And that's just a recent picture of the Hong Kong, uh, one of the Hong Kong arrival um, areas. Um, I think the airlines are doing it. Um, I think the airlines um, have some, are proposing um, some good strategies, multi-layer strategies. Uh, the airlines are very um, enthusiastic on, on, uh, on testing. Um, and, uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's a very nice uh, report from Harvard um, uh, on, on this, uh, um, the, the, the references of the, um, um, is, is at the right um, um, there, but this is a very good um, um, proposal um, that I think if the airlines implemented, um, you know, um, and enforced well, perhaps with some backing from national authorities, um, I think we'd be um, a lot uh, better off. I, I won't even talk about cruise. Um, I won't even talk about uh, cruise ships and military ships, um, et cetera. Um, you know, I don't see how sensible governments can, um, uh, I mean, how could we do better? We could sink, um, we could sink all the cruise ships is uh, the bottom line, um, is the bottom line here, uh, despite the um, effect on, on the economy. Um, military preparedness, there's a huge effect. And this, this may actually stimulate um, um, the research and some very interesting data has come from, um, from, from outbreaks um, like this, 26% uh, of the sailors uh, on this aircraft carrier um, um, got infected. And interestingly for those, um, I think it's provided one of the most interesting pieces um, that 45%, um, there's been a lot of speculation. This is a very extreme circumstance um, with a high infection rate, but 45% um, of the infected uh, persons. This was meticulous military follow-up. Everybody had regular PCRs. Everybody was put in quarantine on shore. Um, you know, thereafter, 45% were asymptomatic and they were followed for 10 weeks. Um, um, so um, 
um, I think that's a good um, indicator. Um, in terms of uh, stimulating some uh, discussion um, here, so we get to uh, two concepts. Um, 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 we get to the immunity passport and um, what mechanism can we use, um, you know, in the future to make, uh, um, to reassure and keep those um, uh, and, and, and keep people at home. So the concept had been proposed uh, early on <coughs> to um, give so-called immunity passport, some kind of document um, to um, uh, uh, travelers that had antibodies. And then we found out that, um, you know, even in countries with widespread, less than 10% um, of the general population has uh, antibodies. So um, that's, that's not a very good, um, that's not a very um, um, good um, approach. And the antibody tests are um, less, um, are less than um, ideal. And, we're beginning to understand that usually when you have antibodies, you are immune. Um, so that's not as big an issue um, as it was um, as it was uh, as it was before. Um, but then that brings us up to this, which we're all very um, used to. Uh, this is a um, you know WHO uh, ICVP International Certificate of Vaccination or prophylaxis, which uh, right now is only being used for uh, for yellow fever and for a few countries they use it for uh, for polio as well. Um, but um, um, this is a very archaic system. Um, it's a uh, handwritten people have stamps it's open to uh, all kinds of uh, forgery um, and uh, as I said it was uh, you know developed uh, decades and decades um, ago and um, uh, when, when there is a coronavirus vaccine or, or uh, another disease comes along and we develop a vaccine um, you know uh, I think we need to be better prepared with uh, digital documentation um, I had a, a couple of days ago, um, um, you know, proposed uh, um, a system um, that they're working on with a number of uh, collaborators, but this is a, a commercial organization and there are other consortia that are primarily commercial um, in um, nature. Uh, one has developed something called Common Pass, um, but um, these, um, you know, these are um, um, you know, this does call, this is being proposed by um, um, commercial uh, interests, but certainly would need to involve governments, regulatory authorities that uh, regulate uh, um, laboratories, educating um, um, travelers, um, you know, and, and quite a large worldwide, um, um, you know, infrastructure, including a uniform uh, app, um, um, you know, that linked into, you know, lab testing ceremonies, certainly a large, large um, infrastructure um, undertaking, uh, but, but, but perhaps it does um, um, require industry to uh, facilitate uh, the uh, development of, um, you know, um, di digital platforms on a worldwide uh, basis like this. And this is their proposed um, um, picture. This is an evolution um, now, apparently uh, a pilot project, uh, they, they say will start um, soon. Uh, as I said, a couple of other commercial organizations have started a pilot project. But I think in terms of better preparation in the future, you know, some kind of 21st um, century uh, technology, um, I think is uh, gonna be uh, required uh, uh, for better preparation, at least for this piece. Um, 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 in the future. Um, and, and maybe I'll leave it to um, um, David Heyman to talk about uh, the uh, um, international public health um, infrastructure um, as far as uh, uh, crystal balling, what uh, that might look like in the future. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, and thanks, Gio. Um, you know, the third question is how can we better prepare? And certainly I think at the basis of the answer to this question, we must all first agree that we're only as well prepared as every country is prepared because these pathogens travel very easily from one country to another. And if there's a country that can't detect rapidly and respond rapidly, then the rest of the world is at risk 
And even though they may be prepared to stop the disease, it may come in anyway. So understanding that better preparedness really depends on better national public health infrastructure so that outbreaks can be rapidly detected, rapidly responded to and prevented from spreading internationally. That's the thesis that I would like to use about how we can better prepare. So around that, we have to be making sure that our development agencies understand that, that their priority is to help countries strengthen their public health capacity, their disease detection, their capacity to respond rapidly so that we're all at an equal risk because that's what it really is, is all about. Today, we don't know who's at equal risk and who isn't because unfortunately what WHO reports as cases is what's being used to monitor whether or not one country is safer than another. But those reports are only the number of positive tests be, being reported and they depend on the testing strategy in that country. So they're really not an indication of what's going on in a country. They're only an indication of the testing strategy. That's why it's maybe more important to look at the number of hospital admissions or the number of deaths in a country as a better marker of what's going on in that country. So as what, what David said earlier, as travel begins to normalize, there need to be a set of indicators that countries can use to do risk assessments of other countries. And WHO is actually working on such a framework. Hopefully it will be developed. At the same time, the second thing that's really important to be better, better prepared is to strengthen our communications globally. Because right now, um, remember, it's the pharmaceutical companies that have put out press releases about those vaccines. And all they tell us is that those vaccines are effective, but effective against preventing disease. So what does that mean? Does that mean that I can get vaccinated and I'm protected against um, infection from others? Or does that mean I've been vaccinated and that vaccine will prevent me from getting serious illness if I've infected? So we don't know that yet. That's something that we need to understand. And now everybody's talking about, well, I'm gonna go get vaccinated and therefore I can travel. Well, that's not the case. They may be able to be vaccinated and not get serious illness, but they may still be carrying that virus in their nose and still be able to transmit it to others. So there's all kinds of things that we need to do to better prepare, starting with better global communications. Hopefully, as the regulatory agencies license these vaccines, they'll do it in a public way so that we can understand what the vaccines are really protecting against and how effective they might be as we do our own risk assessment and decide whether or not we want those vaccines, because that's what it's going to be about. David talked earlier about vaccine hesitancy. There will be less hesitancy if we understand what those vaccines are really doing, and we don't have any false, um, false uh, understandings about them. Suppose, for example, I get vaccinated and I do get sick, but I don't get seriously ill. That means, therefore, that I've been protected, but I haven't been able to be protected against getting infected and maybe infecting others. And if we don't know that, then we'll, we may have a misconception about what vaccines are doing, and we may change our mind and not recommend that others get vaccinated. So how can we be better prepared? Well, we can be better prepared on global communications. We can be better prepared on national capacity strengthening, and we can be better prepared by not distorting our funding to global mechanisms rather than to national capacity strengthening. Over. Thank you, David. Uh, so Francesca, to you. Um, yes, actually we have, a, we have a question on vaccine distribution. Uh, a person comments that the information presented on vaccine distribution is mainly US-based. Um, she, she asks, what efforts have been done from international health organizations and countries to ensure the access to the vaccine in less developed countries and areas? Yes, I guess David Eman, you can give us a hint on that. Okay, well, you know, um, there's been a facility called the COVAX facility, which is a part of the ACT Accelerator. And let me just talk about the ACT Accelerator first. The ACT Accelerator is a mechanism 
created um, by the European Commission and by Wellcome Trust and a group of others that is investing money in making sure that there are mechanisms to more equitably distribute vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. At present, that facility has 3.2 billion euros invested in it. Unfortunately, the US is not a member. Hopefully under Biden, that will change. But that money is now permitting diagnostic test distribution in developing countries at a fair and equitable price. The ACT Accelerator and the COVAX portion of that, which is for vaccines, are not giving away things free. They're negotiating prices. They're making sure that there are prices which are low so that countries can purchase a vaccine or a therapeutic. And then there are development agencies, the World Bank and others, that will be able to provide the funding to those countries to get those things more equitably distributed. So there is an effort to make sure that there is more equitable distribution. And, and that is now have a certain amount of vaccine set aside for distribution um, in lower middle income countries. And all countries can become members of that. There's a very um, important um, discussion that went on with Seth Berkeley, who is the head of Gavi, which is working with the COVAX initiative, with Jane Halton, who's the chairman of the board of CEPI, the collaboration on innovative vaccines that's working, and WHO. And that was at a Chatham House, um, pod, it's in the Chatham House podcast from last week, which talks about the COVAX facility and how that's working to make sure that there will be a more equitable distribution of vaccines. In addition, there is an attempt by, and there will be certainly, production in developing countries such as India, which has a massive production for vaccines, which is um, passing um, WHO standards and which will pre be producing vaccines in bulk for use in developing countries. And these countries will be working through the World Trade Organization to license vaccines from manufacturers who have developed them to be sure that there can be an increased production at a price that's more suitable for developing country use. So those are some of the issues that are going on at present. Maybe David, you could add more about COVAX and others. Um, no, I, th I think that's a very um, good summary. Uh, I, as I said, I hope US participates um, um, soon. I think the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, prioritization of um, doses, the, um, um, you know, um, uh, COVAX has already um, pre-purchased uh, quite a number of doses, um, as you say, um, but I think in terms of um, equity, since most of those doses are going to be um, um, produced in um, rich countries, um, you know, um, the, the delivery of those, um, you know, doses, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how, how they end up uh, uh, being prioritized and whether, um, com um, and whether um, individual, um, you know, countries will um, turn to, you know, Chinese and uh, other producers that are working very hard, Russian, um, that are working uh, very hard on their, um, uh, on, on their own vaccines. I think that's going to be uh, interesting to watch. Thank you. Um, so I see that the discussion on the chat is very uh, productive. Huh? This is very good. Thank you for all, all your comments and questions. So Francesca, another question that you, you want to bring up here? Um, yes, for example, a person asks, why does it seem that Latin America was more affected than Africa? Does Latin America need the CDC? Let, let, me, let, um, let me start there. I've spent um, quite a bit of time uh, over the years um, in uh, Latin America. I'm, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that we know um, all the answers um, there. Certainly, um, I think, um, you know, Brazil had some uh, political, um, um, you know, considerations um, uh, and non-involvement of uh, public health uh, for, uh, for a very long period of time. On the other hand, uh, Peru, um, um, you know, Peru actually, um, you know, took strong measures uh, quite 
early uh, on and was still uh, dramatically infected. And Chile, which is a um, you know very good middle income uh, economy, um, you know, was also. Um, heavily, um, heavily infected. I'm not sure we can just look at um, Latin America, you know, um, uh, um, as a whole. I, I think that, you know, part of it is just uh, simply that um, um, there, there are um, um, the population density um, in um, many parts of uh, Latin America certainly exceeds uh, that um, in Africa, and um, you know that uh, that may have been um, that may have been part of it um, as well. Um, and um, you know, I think just uh, early on, the sheer amount of travel um, into Latin America um, from the places that um, um, were affected early, so. Um, you know, U U.S. to Latin America is extremely heavily um, um, traveled, and Europe, you know, which uh, was affected before um, the the United States, especially countries like Italy and Spain, um, you know, um, are are are, are um, uh, see heavy traffic as well, and. You know, clearly, um, you know, I think measures anywhere weren't um, perfect uh, very, uh, very early on. And I just think it may have been, um, you know, the earlier, um, the earlier seating. Um, as far as a, um, as, as, as far as a Latin American CDC, um, you know, David may want to comment on this. I mean, um, uh, because I haven't followed that closely, the actual PAHO response, but PAHO is an extremely um, strong organization um, in, um, in Latin America and um, has, has good buy-in from, um, you know, most of the, um, uh, from most of the country. So I, you know, I, I you know, it, you know, I think it would be one thing if PAHO needs uh, strengthening. I'm not sure um, th th there would be a call for a, um, you know, separate organization in uh, Latin America. Um, so I'll turn it over to David on that. Thanks, David. Yeah, I'll speak a little bit about Africa because I don't really have anything to answer for Latin America, except that I agree that PAHO is actually the CDC. For the African, for the Latin American countries, and it has great influence, and it it does do quite a good job in getting countries to work together on issues and providing guidance. Um, in Africa, there have been several questions raised, but certainly Africa was very much on the alert very early because of the Africa Center for Disease Control, which was um, very important in providing training in all countries on PCR and getting initial PCR testing out to countries. But there are some issues in Africa which still haven't been completely understood. It's not understood yet why African countries did not see the same exponential increase in hospitalized patients and in deaths as have countries in other parts of the world. And there are several different hypotheses. One is the age, um, as you know, in, in COVID infection, younger people have less serious illness and the median age, that means the number of people above and below that age is 18 years. So it's a very young population that may not have, that may have become infected, but just didn't get ill. In many parts of Africa also, the elderly live in the villages and not in the urban areas. And so maybe the virus has not yet got to those urban villages and maybe there will be an increase in deaths, unfortunately, if that virus does get there somehow or another. And then there's another hypothesis that possibly there are many more other coronavirus infections in Africa that have caused some type of a, a cross immunity with the current infection. As you know, there are four human coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Are they more prevalent in Africa? Are they causing more um, disease in Africa? And is there a protection against them that's protected against the SARS coronavirus too? And finally, the question is, is this just because, as David said, of less dense populations and other epidemiological characteristics? And will we see in the future that there is an exponential rise? We hope not, 
We, everybody hopes not, but this is where Africa stands today. But it has an excellent center for disease control, and it also has a good regional office for WHO. So back to you, uh, um, Joe. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so Francesca, uh, do we have a last question? Because I think we will have to wrap up after that. Uh, so a last question that is... No, we don't have any other question. Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, for this uh, input, David, uh, both Davids. And um, so I think uh, uh, now will be time to uh, uh, wrap up this session. And uh, and uh, so I will uh, let me try to uh, do an overview of what was discussed and shared today. So. Uh, our first uh, uh, question was about the health security challenges of uh, the future. And um, I think uh, David uh, Eman uh, highlighted the need to uh, uh, watch carefully the antimicrobial resistance, the resistance to antibiotic, that antibiotics that is uh, spreading uh, around the world nowadays. And that may be a major issue very soon. Uh, so uh, now uh, uh, the, uh, David uh, uh, Heman also emphasized a link uh, to have between collective and individual security. And, uh, and uh, David Friedman uh, uh, shared with us uh, the importance to analyze uh, uh, situation, uh, reservoir, transmission type, and, uh, and also emphasize that uh, climate change may in fact have an effect on the, the spread of uh, 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 vectors and uh, so the spread of uh, potential uh, infectious disease. Huh? Uh, now, um, the role of military was discussed also, and uh, uh, military played a role in the preparation, uh, but also in response. Huh? And uh, we've seen that uh, in uh, many major uh, events, uh, infectious events, for example, uh, with the Ebola uh, outbreaks in West Africa, the military were really a great help in this, uh, the control of this in the countries which were really with very low resources. So uh, the military play a role certainly in uh, preparation and also response. On the second uh, question, uh, is the international community and our individual countries uh, prepared for the next uh, pandemic? Uh, the um, uh, so the discussion uh, was uh, focused on the vaccine and uh, how uh, there was a real uh, uh, boost in vaccine development with this COVID, and, uh, but also the issues around the vaccine hesitancy, uh, hesitancy from uh, individual people, uh, ethical issues, how are we going to prioritize and uh, also, how do we inform correctly uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the population, the individuals, and, uh, uh, and not only through the private uh, sector channels, but also through the government side, how do we inform them so they can make uh, a choice of uh, uh, the, whether to accept or not uh, the vaccine. Huh? Uh, we discussed also um, uh, issues of privacy, uh, freedom uh, for um, uh, these uh, uh, control measures, how uh, some Asian countries have been able to uh, manage uh, very well uh, this epidemic so far, and uh, but this was at the cost of uh, uh, privacy, uh, uh, cost, cost of privacy control and, uh, 
and uh, and and so uh, the perception was that this is not applicable in every context, and uh, that really we need to make sure that people understand the risk and make their decisions. Um, now, uh, so so basically the issue of personal responsibility also. And in terms of uh, public health response, uh, I think there is an agreement that uh, uh, we are uh, certainly globally uh, not sufficiently uh, prepared, uh, that uh, uh, efforts need to be made to develop capacities and uh, at country level and globally also. And uh, that uh, we need to uh, make sure that we monitor this carefully and uh, adequately. And uh, for example, uh, for with a simulation exercise. Uh, now in terms of uh, uh, measures to put in place, uh, we uh, raised the issue that there is not one single each, uh, measure that can fit all, but uh, it's really a combination of interventions that are the most uh, effective and that uh, we uh, learn uh, while these pandemics develop uh, also that uh, some interventions are more effective than others and uh, that we have to be flexible and adjust uh, on a daily basis almost. Huh? Uh, so there is also a, a need to get a proper consensus between the central level and the local level. Um, and it's normal that at the start of such major issues, major uh, infectious uh, spread, there is a, 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 some confusion, but uh, with time, uh, things get more clearer and uh, we get better. Uh, now we need to think carefully about exit strategy because uh, experience has shown us that uh, if this is not well prepared and well timed, uh, we have a risk of uh, reoccurrence of transmission. How can we uh, better prepare? So David Friedman uh, uh, gave us the illustration of the travel um, and uh, uh, discuss about uh, uh, more uniformity that may be needed, the use of uh, uh, new technologies also for uh, reinforcing the quality of uh, information collected for travel and um, and uh, and I think that was it. Now uh, David Heman uh, brought up again the need to help country to develop capacities and uh, uh, to develop a set of indicators for risk assessment and to increase uh, improve communication globally and don't always leave it to the private sector. Also, uh, David made uh, uh, the point that the ACT accelerator uh, currently in place uh, has for objective to distribute the vaccine diagnostic protective equipment for the countries with the less resources. And uh, uh, so it's an effort for equitable distribution uh, that has a really innovative effort that has been done in the last uh, few months. Huh? And uh, I think uh, also uh, the, 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 the possibility to uh, mobilize more uh, efforts with uh, the CDC, the control for disease uh, groups uh, in South America and Africa was uh, discussed. So this is what I can uh, sum this is what I can uh, summarize from uh, this discussion and uh, now um, I want to also uh, uh, give you uh, my quick uh, point of view on uh, uh, various uh, aspects of this uh, discussion. Uh, I think we see that uh, although we have made uh, substantial progress these past years, 
and we are learning a lot with this pandemic. Uh, so it's clear that until we control the majority of risk, develop the capacities, monitor rigorously these capacities, and better coordinate the initiative for global health security, and also that we mobilize sufficient funds, our world will continue to be threatened by the emergence and re-emergence of infectious disease, and our security will continue to be at stake. However, it is encouraging to see that with technology progress, we are able to develop rapidly and very effectively vaccines, and this may be a key to control to these pandemics in the future. So now a, a very interesting group that I uh, mentioned in my presentation at the beginning is the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. The, this Global uh, Preparedness Monitoring Board is a high level group of experts and uh, has been in existence for the last two years and uh, it's led by the former Director General of WHO, Dr. Brunlan. And uh, I must say these analyses are extremely uh, interesting and I recommend you to uh, take a look at this. Uh, there, are, there have been two reports and this year, uh, the report published in a uh, few weeks ago, uh, uh, said that we are in a world in disorder we are failing to deal with this pandemic. We have a, a fragile interconnected economies and social systems. And uh, the report also said, said that without social security necessary to promote health security, uh, uh, we, we will be facing events like that. So it is also noted that the governance of preparedness for global security is too complex. And this is a little bit what I showed in my slide, you, all these initiatives, and therefore underdeveloped, and uh, that addressing the fragmentation is necessary to facilitate stronger collective action and uh, develop a robust governance of preparedness for health emergencies. This group uh, calls for five key actions, and that will be my last point for uh, today, uh, conference. The first point is uh, leadership, responsible leadership. The second call is for strong and agile national and global system for global health security. The third one is engage citizenship. The fourth one is sustain investment, investment in prevention and preparedness and robust global governance and preparation for health emergency. So this is really in line of what we discussed today. And uh, so this is uh, uh, food for thoughts at the end of this session. And uh, I want to thank you all for having participated to this uh, session. Uh, particular thanks to uh, David Friedman who woke up very early to be with us, to David, uh, uh, David Friedman who woke up early, David Heyman who uh, uh, has really given us a very uh, interesting and uh, comprehensive view of uh, the current uh, situation. And uh, thank you to uh, 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 thank you to the GCSP for organizing this session, giving us a chance to share our views, and Francesca for your help. And uh, unless uh, there is any particular issue you want to raise, David and David, uh, we may end up the session now. Uh, thank you. A pleasure to uh, meet with uh, this group, uh, Gilles. My thanks as well, Gilles, and to the group that participated. Okay, very good. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.